Rushing Wind Biker Church at 10 Peach Tree Court in Holbrook, New York, the crossroads of freedom and faith. God bless you all. Jesus loves you all. Amen. 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 Great job. Great job. Amen. How are we doing? Awesome. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we... Uh, <sighs> Lord, life is just so good. Yes. Lord, just uh, sometimes, Lord, you just touch us, you surround us, and you feel it in the, the hair in your arms, you can feel it in goosebumps, and you just, you just feel something. And Lord, we just thank you as your Holy Spirit just surrounds us at times where we just get this sense that uh, we're surrounded by this awesomeness. And, uh, and Lord, just to understand it's the glory that you sent down that we might experience life at a different level. Um, Lord, we just, we just love your son. He, is, uh, he has brought something into this, this human realm that at, at times it's just hard for even us to grasp and articulate. Uh, Lord, as we, uh, as we come to you today, I ask you to teach us. Father, help us to focus on just how awesome your son is. Lord, what you've given us, uh, the spirit that he sent, that we might, might have a life that is incomprehensible in a world that is hopeless. Let us understand just how, how extraordinary that is, that we can be in this place and, and praise and, and actually have joy when everything outside those doors screams chaos and and darkness and hopelessness. Lord, as we as we hear you today, let us just be so grateful, just so thankful Lord, for the life you've given us in, in Christ Jesus, your Son. We ask that in his name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, it's been an extraordinary weekend, hasn't it? Yes. You know, uh, weather is... Uh, should be inconsequential to us as believers of Christ. Realize that, right? That what's happening in the atmosphere out there with rain and snow and cold and hot, um, it, it should never affect us. You know, all, all it really does is it, it points us in a different direction of, of being service. That's all it really does. And it points us in a different direction of the emotions that we feel and the connections that we, we have with you. And it's been, you know, this weekend has kind of been a microcosm, like, like Jerry said, of, uh, of this year and, and really life, you know, cold and hot, rain and heat, humidity and flooding, you know. And, and we look just, you know, across our country and there's fires. You know, and, and no water. And, uh, you know, keep, keep the West Coast in prayer because they're, they're just burning away. You know? And so when we complain about the rain, let's think about what's going on. You know? And, uh, and God sends the rain for growth. God sends the fire for purging. You know? What would you rather have? I'll take the rain. Amen? Amen. You know? And um, it, it's funny as, a, as a, you know, looking through, through scripture and what we're, we're going to talk about today, and, um, and it's just, sometimes just there, there's things that you know aren't coincidences that kind of come, come, uh, come all together in the course of a week when you, you, you think about how you're going to share what God has on, on your plate, the scripture that you want to dive into. And, uh, and so I was thinking this week, um, how many people have ever known someone that maybe you knew when they were younger and, uh, you know, their life was, was something? Maybe bad, maybe average, maybe mundane, maybe horrible. And, uh, and then, and then you, know, you meet them at your 30th high school reunion. And it's like, no. <laughs> Anybody ever have that moment? 
Anybody have the extraordinary opportunity to be that moment? Yeah. You know, when you're the one in that space, knowing what you were, you know, in school, or maybe after school, or maybe after you dropped out of school. Um, and then, you know, you're, you're the one, it's like people are looking at you and saying, no, that doesn't make sense. You know, you know who, who, do, who does he think he is? No, that, no, that was him. You know, and, and I think, I think some of us have, have, have seen people and met people. And I was thinking about this gentleman that, uh, that I knew in high school. And, and when I was in high school, I was very straight-laced. You know, I, I didn't even know where to get drugs. As crazy as that sounds in the, in the, in the early 70s. You know, because I was into studying and I had my dream of going to college. And I had other issues that uh, drugs probably wouldn't have helped anyway. And so um, I, I remember distinctly there was two kids in school. And, uh, and everybody knew that they were the druggies, you know? And, and just the way they looked and people knew, and, you know, not, not pushers or, or dealers, but those are just the drugged out kids in school, you know? And so you graduate, you move on in your life, and, and, uh, and then you go to church one day, and uh, they introduce this pastor of a church upstate. It's like, that name sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> and he looks like that guy. You know? And uh, you know, I think my, my wife may remember when we, we were in the church, and it was a church where that pastor I talk about, he was the pastor, and they had a retreat center upstate, and they had another church upstate. And then this guy is speaking, and it's like, no, no not him. No, anybody but him. You know? And, and I was so far from God at that point, I wasn't even thinking, you know, well, if God's using that, you know, I wasn't there yet, you know. And, uh, and, and it's interesting, you know, when I, I, I got to talk to him, and, and as I'm, I'm actually putting this message together, I friended him on Facebook. You know, I just I haven't, I haven't talked to him in years. You know, I know he, he was a pastor, and then, you know, there's some challenges, and I know he stepped down from being a pastor, and I didn't know what was going on and now he's running for Congress. The drug guy. You know? And it's like, you know, who does this guy think he is? You know? And, uh, and I'm actually, I'm going to be going up there later this week and we're going to be sitting down and I'm going to try to help him with his campaign because obviously he's a con con conservative right-wing Christian. You know? And he's running for uh, the Albany Congressional District to be their representative in, in Washington. The drugged out guy I from, from school. And it was shocking. You know, you ever have, to have somebody in your past and you meet them, it's like, you know, and you don't even have to know there's a God. It's like, that's a miracle. You know? <laughs> no. You know? And so um, this mindset really speaks into our life of Christ in a very big way. And there's a, there's a story in the Bible when uh, Jesus had that moment. You know, it's kind of interesting that, you know, we, we know Jesus, the Son of God and the Savior, and you know, ministry for three years, but there were moments where people looked at him and said, no, no. Uh, the carpenter. Yeah, I know his brothers. You know, they're just like, you know, they're normal guys. And this is a story we're going to look at today, and there's a powerful thing in here that I think we're going to uh, look at ourselves, and I believe if we allow God to speak to us, we can step into a higher level of, of faith. You know, because the bottom line is we look at ourselves, and, and we know that, that we're new creations in Christ, right? Amen. And we know that God has a plan for our life. Yeah. And we hear that he's got promises for us, to prosper us, and a future, and all these things. And there's a voice inside that says, no, because I know who you are. Uh, you, that's not you. Uh, you could think it's you, but it's not you. And so Mark, Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Uh, Mark writes, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, uh, Nazareth. And it's always a challenge when you go back to your hometown or your high school reunion, so to speak. And uh, the disciples followed him, and when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And, uh, and the many listeners were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? 
And what is this wisdom that he seems to have? And, and the miracles that he performed by, by his hands. Isn't he the carpenter? You know? Son of Mary, you know Mary, it's a small town. It's just Mary's kid. You know? And uh, we know his brothers, you know, James and Joseph. See, Joseph, by the way, is Joseph, so I'm kind of in that, that family of Jesus, because my name's Joseph. You know, just so you know. Because I thought, Joseph, what does that mean? So I look into the roots and it's Joseph. So I'm relating to Jesus very well. You know? uh, I'm the other brother, just like these guys. And there's Judas and Simon. And then they say, you know, look, look over there in, in the synagogue. Those were sisters. You know, this is just a guy with a family and a mother and brothers and, and sisters and and who, who does this guy think he is to be here and to say who he is? And so Jesus took, took, took this as, as something that was astonishing to him. You know, and so he says, makes this statement that we may have heard if you've gone to church enough times. Um, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and among his own relatives and in his own household. You know, and I don't know about you, but yes, it is harder to, to share your faith with people in your, your family because they know the you that isn't this you. And so it's like, well, who do you think you are? Right? Anybody share with your family? And it's like, well, who do you think you are? You know, you're, you're just that that jerk I grew up with, you know, and you're going to tell me, you know, you got this little thing going in your life, seems to be working out, you're going to tell me what's, what's good. And so it's interesting that, that it goes on to say he could, he could do no miracles there, except that he laid his hands on a few people, and he healed the sick, and it was only a few. Now I don't about you, but I'm kind of Confused when the Bible says Jesus can't do something. Does that like bother you? It should bother you. Because if we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, how much more can Christ do all things? Because he's the one with the strength. But it says he couldn't, couldn't do much miracles. He couldn't do very many things. And he wondered at their unbelief. And then he was going around to the villages and teaching. And so he goes back to his hometown. And, uh, and, and this is where he grew up. He spent most of his life. And, um, and it's interesting that they knew everything about him. You know, they'd heard about this guy, Jesus. And it sounds like the guy that, that's from here. And they, they heard about the miracles. And he's teaching in the synagogue. And, uh, and he's teaching with power. And, uh, but there was a problem. Because they knew him growing up. They knew who he was. And not that Jesus was a bad kid. I find it hard to believe Jesus was a bad kid. I hope you agree with me on that. But he was still a kid, and he was in school, and one of the guys, and he grew up with everybody. And so it's like, you know, he came up as a regular human being, and now he's proclaiming to be this. And we know him too well. Who does Jesus actually think he is? The reason why this is so challenging to him is because of what he said in the synagogue. See, Mark, because of his Reader's Digest way of doing things, doesn't say everything. So if you, if you go to Luke, who is just the opposite. See, if, if Luke had a choice between saying something in few words and saying something for a long time, uh, Luke was kind of Pentecostal in nature. He would say it as, as much as he can, as long as he can, with as many words, and, and give you all the details. And so Luke, in his account of the story, it says, He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel. To the poor 
and he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed. And then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down and was quiet. And all eyes were on Jesus. And then he said to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled. Now you have an idea why they were kind of upset. Because this carpenter, who grew up in town, everybody knew him and his family and his mom, is saying the scriptures prophetically were talking about me. So you can kind of understand why they kind of took offense to that. You know, and they come up with all kinds of excuses. Uh, where, where does someone like him get such profound thoughts? You know, and speak so profoundly. And, and wisdom. Wisdom beyond what anybody knew. How, how, could, how could he have that kind of wisdom? You know, wasn't he, wasn't he just a carpenter? How could he do miracles? How could he do the things that everybody says that he did? And he's Mary's kid. Apparently Mary wasn't as esteemed as, as, as we may think at that time. It's like, you know, if it was some you know, just profound you know, matriarch of, of the countryside, you say, okay, you know, but it was like, it's Mary's kid. You know, and, and, and look at his brothers. You know, they were just regular brothers. And so they had, uh, they had an interesting reaction because when you read this, it's like, question after question after question after question. And they almost never give him an opportunity to, to explain. Because within all those questions lie explanations he could have given. But he just said, well, a prophet in his own town you know, is not going to be honored. He said, you all think you know me too well. And I'm being held by the standard of who you think I should be because of what you know about me. Uh, so. I know you're not going to listen no matter what I say. And he was just an ordinary guy. And I think we have problems at times subconsciously because we wouldn't dare to, to, to think this overtly because it kind of goes against our understanding of the scriptures and our understanding of our faith that we know the story of Jesus and he was a human being and he walked with us, and he lived a life just like we lived a life, and he suffered and died a human life. And I think somewhere in our subconscious understanding, we have a problem connecting that to God Almighty, the most powerful force in the universe. Even though we know it to be truth, I think it's something within us that inhibits us from understanding the true power in Jesus Christ because he came as a human being. And, and, and Jesus had a problem with these people and he said uh, he, was, he, was mar he marveled at it. He was uh, astonished that they didn't believe who he was. And you understand when you don't stand in the promise of God and when you have a lack of faith and you step into this place where I know God's done some things but I don't think he can do that, do you understand that Jesus is astonished? That you actually don't believe he can do what he has promised you. He can do. We astonish Jesus all the time, don't we? When we, we don't trust him to do exactly what he promised. When we decide we're not going to make that hard decision. You know? And, and Jesus is like, what more do I got to do? You know? And most of us have gone through things in our life and see things where God has worked miraculous. Still, we're, we come to a thing today and we just can't, we can't get through that. And when we don't stand in that place and have faith, the same reaction Jesus is having with us is the one he had with those people who knew him. You know, it's, really? You know, do you really know who I am? Or are you holding me to some substandard uh, opinion, which is not who I actually am? Your powerful God, the almighty God, who came down and lived among us, you know? And so humanity has always had this problem with Jesus. 
Do you understand it's the main problem that humanity has with, with Christianity? That God would actually come down and, and, and be with us. You know, because man is, is, is good when God stays where he belongs. Right? You know, God, God belongs up there. Up there. You know, big God. Awesome God. You know, because if he's up there, we can understand he runs everything. But when he comes down here, it confuses us. And as much as we, we stand in our faith and we understand our faith, the fact that we don't stand in faith 100% of the time and believe his promises 100% of the time means we don't actually believe fully, we don't have the faith completely that the God of the universe is encapsulated in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, which he dwells us with we're not totally convinced. And the problem is that it's in us. See, that's the problem. Because we know us. Right? And we know God's got promises and we know that everything says that we should be able to walk in victory and walk as overcomers. But there's voices that say, well, don't forget who you are. You know? Because you are supposed to forget who you are. Right? You know? Because now you're a new creation. Amen? You know that? And so who you are is a new creation. But the voices say, well, you know, you're, you're just a carpenter. I was a carpenter. I'm just a carpenter. Yeah? And, uh, and you know, I know my family... I know the problems in the family. I know the problems I've created and been part of. I know my, my, my shortcomings. And so I know that Jesus is, is in me and the Holy Spirit has all confidence in himself. Um, but I just can't do that because I, 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 I know. It's the same thing they accuse Jesus of. You know, because it's the same dynamic. Because Jesus is in you. You believe that. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is within you. Okay? Now you have a dynamic of that scene where you have all these people that were part of the hometown and then you have Jesus who's the son of God. And you have the same dynamic actually within each one of you. Because that old man is the one that knows you. Where you were born who your family is, where you grew up, and it keeps reminding you that, that, no, you can't do that. Because who do you think you are? And today I want us to understand that you better understand who you are. And you are a son of the, the Almighty God, and a daughter of the Almighty God. You have the same power, you have the same influence, you have the same capabilities that Jesus Christ had when he walked the earth. And so when, when you get that thing inside you that says, who do you think you are? Or you get a voice from outside that says, who do you think you are? You start thinking like Jesus. I know who I am. And I know who I believe in. And I know he is able. And I know there's nothing that I can't do to Christ who strengthens me. But we don't listen to those those, we don't listen to that voice. We listen to the, the other voices. You know? and, and it goes back, and like I said, there's different, different ways people approach God. You know, and, and people become like their God. Have you ever heard that? People become like their God. You know? If you have someone that is into a spirituality, there's a strangeness about them. There's an obscure spirituality that you almost can't define. They can't actually put everything in words. It's, it's just, you know, it's kind of out there. Right? Um, and philosophies are the same way. Because they're just mindsets. You know? And then you take a God, say Allah. Allah is an oppressive God that wants worshipers. And you're, you're, you're so, so below him. And so you have a God who just deals with fear. I am to be feared. And so you develop a religion based on fear. 
And people who embody their God become oppressive, convert or die. And then we have our God, the God of love and compassion. The true sign of a follower of Jesus Christ is one who's full of love and compassion and doesn't judge and is merciful and goes out and helps. You know? And that's really what a Christian is, if we become like our God. God said he created us in his image and in his likeness. We know that God is love, so really everything that embodies love should embody us. And now you have all these philosophies of God, and we have ours. And, and the difference is uh, there's an empty grave to prove ours. There are no other empty graves. I hope you know that. There are no other empty graves. You know, the fact that Jesus walked out of the grave is proof positive that our God is God. Therefore, if Jesus walked out of the grave, then he was empowered by the real, true and living God. And even though he walked as one of us, among us, it's the biggest act of the miraculous that has ever been done. So the biggest miracle God did wasn't parting the Red Sea. The biggest miracle God did wasn't fire from heaven. It wasn't a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The biggest miracle that God ever, ever did in this human realm was coming down as a human being, being one of us, having a childhood like we have a childhood, having a life like we have a life, right? having a profession, blue collar. Let me get proud to be a blue collar worker. Jesus is a blue collar guy, you know? And, and he, had, he had family like we had family, he had brothers and sisters. And he had challenges, he had issues, and he overcame them, but he had the same ones we had. And he bled the same blood that we bleed. And he died the same death that we will die. But then he rose from the dead and it changed everything. Because the day he rose from the dead is the day that he said, this is what I'm offering you. you know, death has been redefined. And so we need to understand when we believe or not believe in what Jesus is telling us our life is, is for, what our vision is, we have to start understanding that this is the God who is the power of the universe. Yes, he was a man. Thank God he was a man. But we have to stop listening to the voices. Amen? And I think part of the problem even us as Christians have that we might love Jesus. We might love him with all our heart. But we still have this thing. And you might not even understand that you have it. But a big portion of why we can't stand sometimes is because Jesus was a man. Because if we were as convinced of our God with tangible evidence that he was a God up there that was ruling and huge and up there, I don't think we'd have a problem in listening to him. You know what I'm saying? I think the problem is the thing that was the very miracle and the very act of grace that brought Jesus here to sit as your sin, to be able to turn in a seat in a synagogue and see the Son of God sitting there. The very act of grace that empowers everything we know to be true, in a strange sense, is also one of the major obstacles that we have to trust in that the man who was God, who was man, that was God, that was a man, gives us the power to do everything in this world. See, we prove that fact every time we don't stand in faith. You know? We love Jesus. We know Jesus. We surrendered our life to Jesus. But how many people are living a perfect life out there? How many people are making all the right decisions? You know? And I believe this is, this is part of the challenge 
within our mentality as human beings. You know, there's something inside us that has a hard time comprehending that, that God would be one of us. We know it, we can intellectualize it, we can even have faith in it. But the fact is sometimes we don't stand in it. You know, how many people here have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ? Pretty much everybody in the room, right? How many people know that means that the Holy Spirit isn't dwelling in you? How many people understand that that's the same Spirit that brought Jesus Christ out of the grave? It's the same Spirit that allowed him to lay hands on people and heal them. You know? To speak and demons came out. Okay? And so what we have within us is the same conversation that happened in that synagogue. You know? Because we have Jesus in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen? And we have this dead old man which we tend to believe, which is all the people in the synagogue who are saying, I know who you really are. You know? And then we have the Holy Spirit in us, which was Jesus there saying, yes, but this is who I really am. And it doesn't matter what you think. And, and when you think about grieving the Holy Spirit, you know, there's a lot of things that, that kind of fall into the category of grieving the Holy Spirit. But... Part of the grieving of the Holy Spirit, exactly what happened in this synagogue. When Jesus said he was astonished that they didn't believe who he was, having seen miracles, it's the same reaction the Holy Spirit has in us when he has said, this is what God wants you to do and I'm empowering you to do it. And we say, I don't think I can do that. And so part of grieving the Holy Spirit is the same thing. It's like, really? Do you know who I am? You know? And that's the spirit already in you. And so we have this, 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 this struggle. And we have to understand that the old man is definitely dead. Amen. See, Jesus knew he didn't even have an old man. You know? And so we have to get in the mindset like Jesus had. The old man is, is, is non-existent. And then when Jesus says something, we believe it. But when the Holy Spirit says step in this and do that do we believe it instead of listening to the voices that you know say well i'm not capable of that because i'm you know look at the life i live i know i have jesus in me the hope of glory but you know i, I can do these things but i don't know if i can do those things you ever struggle with that no let's be honest i mean you know it's like you know we've seen things and, and god has used us but then there's a big thing it's like you know, I don't know about that. You know, that's for somebody else. You know, because they're more worthy than I am. You know, and we have this struggle. Um, I mean, look at where I came from in life. You know, you had to think, you know, Nazareth, and and they're from Nazareth. You know, it's like it's like I'm in Mastic Beach, not not one of the higher uh, kind of uh, status towns in Long Island. Okay, so I'm in I'm in, I'm in Mastic Beach, and Messiah comes out of Mastic Beach. And it's like, that's great. I don't know about Mass Beach. You know? Sands Point. You know? Mutton Town. Mutton Town. You know? Hamptons, maybe. You know, some place where, you know, powerful, important people come from. And so they were even struggling with that. It, it should be such a blessing because we looked at this as human beings, that our Savior was a human being and he walked like us. Don't you think it should have been empowerment to these people? Like, Messiah is going to be known from the town we grew up in. You know, wouldn't that be great? No, apparently it didn't work. Because they, as a community, had a mentality, you, know, like you, you can't come from here, you know, because it's Nazareth. You know, this is like ghetto. And, and Messiah can't come from ghetto. I'd be cool, but, you know, I know ghetto. Messiah can't come from ghetto. It's the same, the same mentality that we have when we look at ourselves sometimes. We forget that we've surrendered our lives. We've surrendered the brokenness and the old man. We've surrendered that. That's all dead and gone. You know, I'm convinced that, that many of you in this room have not been able to step into the life that God has had for you because you are stuck in this place where I know who I was and I know God has a victorious life for me 
and you're accepting a minimal, a minimal victory in your life, thinking that's all God would have for you. And you've been so deceived by the enemy. Because look who Jesus used. And they, they just totally changed the world. There's not one person in this room that is beneath where the guys that walked with Jesus were. Yeah? Because they just weren't, you know, they weren't the cream of the crop. You know? Which is the beauty of the gospel. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting how lack of faith actually inhibits the movement and the power of Jesus Christ. You know, I mentioned that earlier. You know, when I read the scriptures and I read that Jesus couldn't do miracles. Doesn't it make you think? Why couldn't Jesus do miracles? It's because they didn't believe who he was. Now think about when we don't walk in victory. What is it saying about us? Yeah? Because Jesus wants to do great things in you. And Jesus can do absolutely everything in you. But if we don't believe it fully, we'll have a minimum, a minimum amount of victory in our life. You know? Verse 5, he could do he could do no miracle. It's like that shouldn't be in the Bible. Don't you think that shouldn't be in the Bible? Talking about Jesus, he could do no miracle. The Jesus we knew? I don't, I don't care. You know, that doesn't jive when I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. It sounds like, well, it should be two different books, right? And so there's got to be something there. Because if something is binding Jesus' very hands from moving in the miraculous, that means there's something that we're culpable of. There's something that, that we are responsible for to have things in our own life. You know, and one of the things we, we saw the last couple of weeks, uh, last week in particular, it's not, not on the screen, but if you remember last week about uh, Jairus' daughter, and we saw that, you know, when, when Jesus said, I'm going to go heal this, this, this girl, and then she dies, people didn't believe. What did Jesus do? Go home. I don't need you. Because their lack of faith would complicate the situation. And then he came to Jairus' house and said, why are you so upset? She's only sleeping. And he, they mocked him. Are you crazy? We know she died. We were here. Where were you? Ooh. You don't put Jesus in the corner like that. And so Jesus said, get out of here. We don't need you. You know? And what I mentioned last week is in order to see the miraculous, in order to see the extraordinary, you need to step in faith. You need to be in the room. Because Jesus is going to eliminate the things that are going to inhibit him moving. That's what he did then. And only three people were in the room and the two parents. And all the people that followed him and saw other stuff, the minute there was unbelief, he said, we don't need you. Because you're just going to make it harder for the people who are holding on to their faith to continue holding on to their faith. See, and um, I'm scrambling my message today just so... So you know, the Holy Spirit is taking this in different roads than, uh, than I anticipated. The old man is constantly whispering in our ears about what we can't do and what we can do. One point I want to make is we look for the big things, don't we? You know, and we tend to think that God doesn't work in the small things. And what I, what I, want, to, I want to give you two examples. Um, sometimes I believe the miraculous is different than what we anticipated would be. You know, when we we have something that's wrong with us health-wise, we anticipate the miraculous to be healed, don't we? We kind of think that's how God works. But I want to propose to you that I think more often God works a different way. And, you know, because of, of um, my past year, I've grown very close to, to Jesus. Why I just I don't put up with stuff anymore, you know. And um, and I had made a decision that moving forward in my life, there were things I was going to do differently. You know, one of those things is, is I was going to go out and I was going to spend more time with my wife, 
and I was going to do things that my wife liked. You know? And you can ask her, that's a new thought for me. <laughs> yeah? And so, uh, but I'm going to do that. Because you look at life differently. You know, when certain things are put on your plate. So, so I went to my brothers and, you know, we're kind of wondering, what are we going to do in Winchester, Virginia? And it's raining, you can't, can't ride. <laughs> so my sister-in-law, it's a museum. <laughs> Rose gardens. So, in my mind, I'm like, is there anything more exciting than that? <laughs> you know, is there stuff that I, I, I want to do? Um, and, you know, and, and, and now I'm to the point where I keep that in my mind. You know, married 40-something years, you know, you, you say stupid things enough times, you eventually learn to keep things here and not let them out. You know? And so now I'm determined, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to take my wife, because she loves museums and she loves to walk. Right? They are so low on my priorities. <laughs> yeah. Matter of fact, priority list is, a, is, is actually, doesn't go together with those things <laughs> in my life. But now, wanting to do things that my wife enjoys is high on my priorities. Yeah. And so, we're going to go, we we'll come downstairs that morning, and something happened when I stepped off the bottom step and my knee blew out. What am I going to do? What did I do before? You know? And I have a wife who would, would have very, you know, would have been, okay, you, you heard me, we can make other plans. And I just not doing it. Not changing my plans. You know? And and my knee was hurt. My knee was hurt. I don't know how bad it was hurt, but you know, I didn't pray for healing. I prayed for God to help me endure because I wanted my wife to have a, a good time. And I wanted her to enjoy. You know, and so we went out, and getting out of there. Every time I got in the car, it's like you got, you got long legs, and no matter how big the car is, you're bending your knees, and it's just. And so, so then we get we go to the place. And it's a museum, you know. I actually kind of enjoyed it. I showed them one day. You want to know how God blessed me? We walk in the museum. What's the first picture? It's a picture of this Civil War, Civil War guy on like this motorcycle thing. I can take that. I know Jerry liked the picture, you know? And it was funny because, you know, you walk in and this guy, I don't know if it was General whatever, it was Custer? Was it Custer? <laughs> and, no, it couldn't have been Custer, because this was a Winchester, it was a Shenandoah Valley Museum. It had to be a general from the, the Civil War. So he's on this, he's on this, this, this scoop, man. So that's cool. And then to make it, make it interesting, uh, the guy who created this thing, he was like made out of garbage. You ever see art made out of garbage? I love art made out of garbage. <laughs> like, hidden behind this little thing is a little triangle patch that says 1% on it. <laughs> I don't know if Jerry saw that in the picture. Blow the picture up. And I said, whoa, that's, that's, that's authentic. This is authentic biker stuff now. <laughs> and so it kind of made it a little more interesting. But I, I walked, and I, it, it hurt. But the more I walked, the less it hurt. The more I walked, the less it hurt. And I actually find myself reading these, it seemed like two million plaques on everything in the museum. You know, I don't even do that when I go to Cooperstown in the Baseball Hall of Fame. I'm not reading the plaques. I'm just looking at pictures. You know, and so, so it was miraculous how God got me through that. Then we walk out into the garden area, lots of gardens, lots of stuff. Lego things. If you saw my Facebook thing, there's Lego stuff. Right. You ever seen like the worst place to walk when you got bad knees? It was all pieces of slate that were like this, and like this, and like this. And if I catch my toe on one, I'm seeing stars and I'm probably going down. And it was the whole thing. And then we got out of that. And then there's bricks that are the same way. Brick. You know? God, say, God, you're funny. You know? <laughs> and. And I did it. And my knees bothered me less, and they bothered me less, and they bothered me less. Because I think sometimes we don't understand when we walk in the spirit, it doesn't mean we're healed. 
It means what happens in my flesh does not matter any longer. You know? And plus I was motivated by love. See, the miraculous happens when you're motivated by love. And so, you know, what does this have to do with this? My flesh, why don't you go sit down? You're going to hurt your knee, you're going to make it worse. You know, and, and a lot of times there's little things in our life that we start to see how God is there and the Holy Spirit is in you. You know, because everything in my flesh was like, I don't even want to do this when I'm healthy. You know? And then I have every excuse to say, why don't we wait until next time we come? Uh, why don't we do this another time? We'll do something else. And, and because I, I, trust, I trust God with my body, and I knew I wanted to do something, which when you do something to honor the one you love, you're doing something to honor Jesus Christ and your Lord. And so the motivations coincide. And because I refused to listen to the voices, I got to experience what is called abundant life. Now, abundant life isn't just that I didn't feel the pain anymore. The abundant life is it's a special thing when you, you have a relationship and you make a commitment to do something, maybe even something you don't really want to do. And at the end of it, you're just so blessed. And it was an extraordinary experience. You know? And this all comes into play, because how many times in our life have we missed things with people? Little things. I wanted to go there, but it was raining. I want to do this, but that came up. Something little came up. And we don't persevere. You know, because we're not perseverers. I don't know if you ever had that mentality. You know? I mean, you get in a mentality of, I'm not going to be victorious, because it's not who I am. So if any kind of obstacle comes in, I'm just going to go lay on the couch and do what I normally do. And so little things build a momentum, and it builds a mindset of faith. Right? Because for me to believe that I couldn't do that with my wife would, would have been a total lack of faith. When I already had the commitment, I was doing something that was going to honor God, and the enemy said, no, I'm going to make it where you can't do that. Well, if you have a mindset that the enemy can't make you not do something, you will never not do something again. You know? If I was going to be in pain every step of that way, I was going to do what I had to do to be with my wife. And God blessed me. And the Holy Spirit lifted my spirit out of the pain in my knee. You know? And, and, and I, I say this sometimes. I don't know at times if the pain is gone or I'm walking in the spirit. Uh, because I've had bad knees for years. Bad knees for years. You know? Uh, I should have had knee replacement a long time ago. I got bone on bone. But I walk around all the time, you know, and other than that little, you know, once in a while I get a tweak. You know, it's like it doesn't make sense that I should be walking around and, and being uh, pain free. That's a victorious life. You know, is it a big windfall? Is it a huge thing? Yeah, it is. It is. We have to change our mindset. Uh, and sometimes the, the little important things are way more important than the big things. You know, and, um, and so, so last week I had an opportunity to experience abundant life and not listen to the voices in my head. You know? I, I want to talk about something that happened last night. And uh, it's the beauty of the body of Christ. Because we, we learn from each other. We're empowered by each other. And so uh, he went to a wedding last night. Dancing. We have video. Bad knee. Right? Funny thing is, I told my wife I was going to bring the knee brace. I subconsciously forgot the knee brace. And so I had the mentality like I had and we had one or two dances, and my knee was starting to act up. You know? Sometimes people surround you, God surrounds you with people for a reason. That's the power of you. you know? And so we're there, and I'm sitting, 
my knees kind of throb a little bit. But I'm watching somebody with knees ten times worse than mine. And I'm seeing someone who's just dancing in the spirit. Yeah? Because I know how bad the knees are. I said, that's cool. One of the biggest blessings of night. But then my wife gets up to dance, and uh, somebody came up and grabbed my hand and said, you got to get up and dance. Thank you. <laughs> no, because we're here to encourage each other. You know? And watching her dance, like there was never, ever a problem with her knees. It just blessed me the whole night. But when she came over and grabbed my hand and said, you got to go dance with your wife, it changed, changed my mindset. Because the old man started to come back a little bit. And I could have very easily sat there and waited for some more, some more slow dances. But I didn't. And I don't know how much of that video is going to get out. <laughs> but, you know. I saw it was good video. But, but we got to understand who we are in Christ. Right? Who we are in Christ is someone that has bad knees that can get up and dance and they're not going to let the knees steal life from them. And steal the joy. The joy on that woman's face as she was dancing was, was miraculous. You know? And I know I'm probably embarrassing her right now. You know, but I asked your husband if I could embarrass you. It's a, it's a good embarrassment, you know? And, and, and it's these things that, that bring the power of these truths to where they're real. And to where the voices that say, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Who are you and who do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you're going to go to this place and have a good time where you're crippled? You know, there's the voices in our head. And it's only by the Spirit of God that dwells with us that we can say, no, I'm going to endure the pain if I have to. You're not stealing what God has for me. Just in, in the joy of a night. You know? We need people to remind us who we are in Christ. Instead of the naysayers who want to remind you who you used to be. And so the story touches on a lot of different levels. You know, lack of faith is going to steal from us much of our life. And don't think lack of faith is just not believing the big things. Lack of faith is not believing the small things that add up and really give you the totality of abundant life. Because that last night changed a lot of things. You know? And the people were there, they knew it. It wasn't just two people with bad knees. There was an atmosphere of the people in our church that was celebrating an abundant life experience together. And it didn't matter what they were going through. It didn't matter how they felt. It didn't matter if they had issues in their head at the time. You know? It was a spirit-filled moment. You know, me and Jerry were talking about it. We were just sitting, it's like, it's just such an awesome thing to watch. And we know people's issues, and we know what are going on in people's lives, you know. And, uh, and I want to close, if, if the, the van wants to come back up. This is a scripture that I want us to kind of understand the depth of what, what John is saying in 1 John. And 1 John, uh, I've said many times, is one of my favorite books. Because it gives us the ability to look at ourselves and see if we have this thing called eternal life. If we've got a momentum going in the right direction. Uh, but I want to bring us to a, a, a deeper and maybe longer standing understanding of what this scripture is saying to us. What was from the beginning, what we heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, what we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And that life was manifested. And we have seen and we testify and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and what we have heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be complete.
And I want to bring you the process of the Christian story from that moment. John is saying, we walked with Jesus. An eyewitness. You know? The beloved apostle, Jesus held me in his arms. You know, real flesh. Real person. We saw him heal. We saw him do miracles. We saw him love in a level we'd never seen before. And that power was now indwelled in the twelve. And those twelve went out, and when people saw the twelve, they said, I've seen. I've seen life. I've seen the power of God. I've seen resurrection life in John and Peter and Stephen getting stoned. And I've seen the tangible evidence, and I know that it's real. And then those 12, they expanded the church to thousands and thousands. And thousands of people who said, I saw, I saw John, and I saw, I saw the fathers of our faith. And then those people walked in power. And they knew who they were in Christ. And then other people saw the thousands. And they said, we've seen and we've touched. You know, many of you in here and myself have, have seen and been with Christians who have moved in the miraculous. And people who have been healed and people whose lives have been changed. And we know because we've looked in, in their eyes and we've sat with them. And we hold them in our arms and we've heard them speak. And the same thing should be going through our heads. Is I've seen. Because in that person is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Christ in him, the hope of glory. And when we go out there, people should meet you. And they should see you and they should hear you. And like these stories of dancing, and dancing in the miraculous. And people should be seeing you as they see us once in a while and saying, I've, I've seen you. Now, I've seen the reality of, of the power of God. I've seen the miraculous. We've touched it in our hands. I've, I've sat and I've, I shook hands and I had coffee with someone who, who, who overcame a disease and, and, and they're fine. You know? Or I see someone who's, who's battling a disease. You know, you ever visit someone in the hospital and it just seems like they're ministering to you? Isn't that the weirdest thing? You know, and, and maybe they're not healed. But they're healed. Because true healing is in our spirit. True healing is when our spirit will not give in to what the body has. Oh, at times God will decide he wants to do the miraculous in our flesh. But I wonder at times which is more miraculous. You know, which would be a bigger miracle to me if my knee was miraculously healed and I didn't feel anymore? Or if I could continue to go through my life knowing my knee was hurt? and totally not aware that there's any pain. And it doesn't stop me from doing what God wants me to do. Which is a bigger miracle? I'm starting to wonder which is a bigger miracle. You know, because that almost to me is a more lasting miracle. You know, the fact that I can be moving in a place where I'm just oblivious to the pain and suffering in our lives. And that really is the mind of Christ. You know? To participate in the sufferings of Christ doesn't mean to be eliminated of the sufferings of Christ. You know? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He still went to the cross, didn't he? But he went there with joy. And, and I believe even though there was excruciating pain when he was in the spirit, I don't believe that pain, that pain was inconsequential to what his mission was. It's like when Stephen was stoned in the streets, and he's looking up and he's seeing Jesus on the throne and he's praying for forgiveness for the people. I don't believe he felt any stone that hit him. It killed him. I don't believe he felt any one of them. Because he was in the spirit and he was loving on the people that were throwing the stones and he was seeing his Savior. And so to me, maybe things like that show Jesus even in more power. And people need to look at us then they need to say, we've seen it with our own eyes. We've touched it. We've heard things that don't make sense. That should be our story. You know, not something that's relegated to Jesus and John talking about Jesus. That should be the world talking about us. Because that's what the light of the world is. That proves that the living word of God is real. That's what proves that God is real. 
Jesus is amazed at two things. Do you know that? I'm going to close on this point. You realize Jesus is amazed at two things. One, he's just mentioned. He's amazed when you know who he is, you've seen him work, and you can't believe him for this thing. That's one of the things that amazes Jesus. There's another thing that amazes Jesus. And it was with the centurion. When the centurion came to Jesus, and he's not, he's not a Jew, it's not even his Messiah, but he knows the power of this man. To the point where he says, you don't even have to come and see my servant. I know if you just say the word. And Jesus was amazed at his faith. That should be our goal. To stop amazing Jesus with our lack of faith. And start amazing Jesus like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You know? And Jesus said, nowhere in Israel is anywhere with greater faith than this centurion. Now, I don't know about you, but I want, I want Jesus to be amazed at my faith. You know? But it takes not listening to the voices. You know? And so, we struggle. And we have these things in us because we, we remember who we were. It doesn't matter who we were. You know? Christ in us, the hope of glory. And do the things, and little things. There's nothing inconsequential. You know, I saw that this week. You know, we're talking about walking in a rose garden and going through a museum. But as a powerful truth was unleashed in my life. And a powerful moment was not missed for me and my wife. Just think about it. That's not a small thing. You know? You know, it's not huge. It's not like, you know, getting healed of cancer is huge. This was, it even impacted me more. You know? So I want us to, to start to walk in this more. And, and like my sister spoke encouraging words to me, this is part of what we do. When someone's wavering, it's up to us to say, you can do this. You know? Grab them by the hand and say, okay, come on, let's do this. You know? Because Christ in you is, is, is bigger than anything you're going through. You know? And, and anything motivated by love is going to happen. Amen? Let's close. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you that you work. You work in our lives in, in, in every level of activity. Lord, let us not be in a, a place where we're waiting to find a, a big moment of extraordinary things to muster up all our faith and call Satan a liar. Let us be people that walk out in everything that comes in our, our path, that tries to steal a moment, steal a, a journey, keep us from doing something which we may think isn't that important, but in our soul we know it is important. Lord, I pray that your people don't miss what you have for them, the extraordinary in every moment of their life. Let us remember that Satan is a liar. And Satan is propping up our old man trying to remind us that we haven't changed. But let us never forget he's a liar. And the old man is dead. And Lord, we just want to want to enjoy your experience with us in this life in the extraordinary. Lord, it's not, it's not selfish to want abundant life. It is our goal to want abundant life in the way you described it. Your word tells us that there is a level where we can't love ourselves. Let us understand that that love is a love that is going to shine into the world. Because we love others as ourselves and we walk in the miraculous. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this place, this family. And we thank you for dancing at weddings. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
ourselves from how God wants to bless us in all areas of our lives. We're our own worst enemy. Amen? Can we be honest here? You know, and there's so many things Jesus wants to do in every one of your lives, and he hasn't done it because his hands have been tied, because you haven't fully engaged in the faith and you're believing that you know, you're something that you no longer are. So let's go out and just change, change our lives. Because if we allow God to change our lives and walk in the miraculous, even in the little things, we won't have to worry about the world changing. We can stand in faith for the things with us. You know, then people are going to say, I've seen it. I felt it. I've heard it. 
testimony of the power. And then they're going to see Jesus in you, and, and then the Holy Spirit does the miraculous. Amen? Father, as we leave this place, we just ask you to continue to empower us, Lord, to not listen to the voices in our own heads, Lord. Lord, whether they're, they're subliminal and we don't even know it's there. Uh, Lord, let us be overbearing in our confidence of who we are in Christ. We'll drown out even voices we don't think we hear, that we know we can do because we know who we are. And when everything in us and everything on the outside says, who do you think 